this part of the lecture, we will talk about tax incidents. So tax incidents, bluntly speaking, tells us who pays for the tax. And here we need to make a very important distinction. Because just because someone transfers money to the revenue commissioner or to the exchequer or taxman or whatever you call the authority that, that collects the taxes, does not mean that that person actually pays economically for the tax. So we will learn in this course that there is a difference between statutory incidents, so that's the amount that someone has to pay legally to the taxman, and economic incidents, which is the economic burden of that tax. And we will learn under what conditions, what side of the market pays more in terms of tax burden. So we will learn three rules of tax incidents. So first of all, we will learn that the statutory burden of a tax does not describe who really bears the tax. So who really pays economically for the tax? Who is economically harmed by a tax? What we will also learn is that if we want to think about the distribution of tax burdens, so what side of the market pays economically, it does not matter on what side of the market it is imposed. That does not tell us anything about the distribution of the, of the tax burdens. Okay? So whether we force consumers to pay a sales tax at checkout or whether we force companies to pay that tax, that a tax of the same amount, obviously the who pays for the tax differs in both cases, at least, you know, who, who does that transaction, but who pays the cost is completely, uh, is a completely different question. And what we will also learn is that the parties that have inelastic supplier demand are the ones that bear the taxes. So in other words, the tax burden will not fall on those market participants who can easily move away from whatever good is getting taxed. So these people will, people or firms will have it easy to avoid it. And because they can easily avoid it, they don't bear that much of the tax burden in the first place. But the tax burden is borne by those who cannot easily substitute away from the good or service that is getting taxed. So we start looking at tax incidents through the simplest possible model of a labor market. So in a labor market, this may sound strange if you hear it for the first time, but we consider labor supply as the supply of workers to the labor market. So the amount of labor that workers supply to the labor market. And we consider labor demand not as the amount of work that workers want to have. No, it's the labor demand of firms. So how much labor do firms want? That's labor demand. And the good thing about looking at a labor market this way is that we can use the standard supply and demand model that we know from basic microeconomics. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look now at uh, that model and graphically try to, to think about well, what happens if employers have to pay a payroll tax. And then we want to see, well, if we have that payroll tax, where basically employers as soon as they, they pay out the workers, they, they immediately keep a chunk of the, of the gross salary and transfer it to the taxman. Who pays for that actually economically? Is it the firms or is it the workers or both? And if so, who pays more? 
So this is the pre-tax equilibrium. Um, so here the quantity is employment, could also be hours of work. Um, the price is the wage. And so we have a supply curve, which is the behavior of, which summarizes the behavior of workers. So for a, we assume here that for a higher wage, more people would work, right? There would be greater labor supply if the wage is higher. And we assume a downward sloping labor demand curve, which means that the lower the wage rate, the cheaper it is obviously for firms to hire workers. And so the more workers they would hire. Right? And so in this, uh, in this market, we have then an equilibrium where those two lines cross, where demand and, and supply are the same. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna differentiate here between the gross and net wage, just as you have it when you start working in a, in a job in, in the private or public sector, your employer will pay a wage, a gross wage, um, but uh, what arrives in your bank account, and you will be shocked when you see this for the first time, um, is your net wage, which is a lot, lot less than the gross wage. Okay, so, so we consider payroll taxes as um, basically imposed by the state on, on employers. So the, the gross wage here is the net wage plus the tax. It's very simple. And so this is equivalent to the demand curve shifting down by the amount of the tax. Okay? Because the, the demand curve is a, is a function of wages and describes the, the behavior of the employers who now for every unit of employment, no matter how much they employ, have to pay a tax T. Okay? And so, so that's, that's what we get here. Okay, so, so the, the demand curve, the labor demand curve shifts down by the amount T. So now we have a new equilibrium um, because the relevant demand curve for uh, for that labor market is actually this one here, so DL prime. And so the new equilibrium is here. So we have less employment and we have a lower, well, in this case, net wage, right? So what, what can we read from this, 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 uh, diagram or from this graph. What can we learn from it? What can we learn about the taxes? So first of all, the, the tax bill, you can easily see here what it is. The employer has to pay a tax T for every worker they, are, they employ. Okay? So the number of workers they employ, you can see here on the horizontal axis, that's this much, so from zero to E prime, so it's E prime. And so the tax bill would then simply be that rectangle there. So it's, it's T times E prime. Okay, so T times E prime, that's the tax bill. And if you remember from uh, lecture two, when we talked about the con consumers rent and uh, sorry the consumer surplus and the producer surplus you have the same things here i wouldn't call them like that but uh, they are mainly the economic rents they're rather the economic rents that go to workers and the economic rents that go to firms okay? so if we think about it like that that we have a uh, again a market in which we have a supply curve and a demand curve. Um, and we have an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. So in this case, it's the number of workers or the work hours of work and the wage. And so then that triangle up here would be the in, in standard micro theory, the consumer surplus, but here it's really the economic rent that goes to employers. Okay, so we can call it either employer's rent 
or the rent that goes to employers, something like that. Um, whereas down here, uh, we would have the rent that goes to workers. Right? Now, if there is a tax levied, you can already see what's going to happen. Part of the tax bill will be borne by the workers and part by the employers. And so you can see here the, the part that is borne by the employers, sorry, the part that is borne by the employees is here at the bottom, right? So, so this is how many workers are employed. Um, and then th that part that lies basically below the initial equilibrium, whereas the surface up here, that's the tax bill that is borne economically by the employers. Right? So, so this already shows us something. It shows us that we have a tax bill and this tax bill comes from the government levying a tax that is to be paid by the employers. And yet, the employers and the employees split the actual economic bill. Now, why is that? It's very simple because the employers are now, because the, the, the empl employers, apologies, the employers are passing on part of that tax to the employees. Okay? So at the new equilibrium, we have fewer people who are in work and they have to pay, they have to work for a lower net wage than before the tax. And before the tax, before the introduction of the tax, the net wage was W star. Now the net wage of workers is WW. It's the net wage. Okay, so, so employers' net wage is goes down after the tax. So, so what that means is that employers pass on this part of this tax to the, the employees, but only part of it, right? They don't shift it all onto the employees through lower wages. Part of it is also then borne by the employers and that's the orange surface up here, right? So why is this borne by the employers? Well, because they, they can't pass on everything to the, to the workers um, that would not be that would not be optimal. Simply, it's it's actually optimal for them to only because the supply curve is the, a certain slope. So it's not beneficial for the employers to to pass on the entire tax increase to the workers. Okay, because if they did that, let's say if they reduced uh, the amount, uh, if they reduced the net wage a lot more. Let's say if uh, if the the tax was um, so so let's say if if the amount of the tax t would be here if they offered them a net wage that was that low then obviously so so that would mean they would pass on everything but then only very few workers would actually be willing to work for that amount of money and so it's not profit maximizing for the firms. So for the firms, it actually pays off not to pass on the entire tax to the workers through wages, but to bear part of the cost themselves. Now, another thing that comes up here is the so-called deadweight loss. So we have, on the one hand, this tax bill that is characterized by that rectangle here and that from the perspective of the economy is not a welfare loss it's obviously the case that workers and employers have to pay that tax in this picture roughly 50 50 um but obviously that tax that tax revenue is then in the economy and can be used for something else, right? So, so it's used to, 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 for public spending, is used for, for all sorts of purposes, 
So that doesn't get, isn't lost to the economy. However, there is an efficiency loss here, which is called the deadweight loss. Yeah, so, so here we again have part of the equity efficiency trade-off, whereby if we don't levy a tax and don't redistribute the revenues, we have a larger pie, but potentially a more unequal distribution of whatever resource we, we want to consider. And the difference is the deadweight loss. So that's that triangle here that, that you can, can see here. Now, what is the deadweight loss? The deadweight loss is, as I said, the efficiency loss because we no longer produce at the level E and workers no longer earn a net wage at the level W star. Okay, so, so, so that the, the production that used to be there and that then resulted in rents for both workers and, and, and uh, employers is no longer there because of the tax. Because now it is no longer economically viable to produce with so many workers, but only at the level that, that you can get with workers of to the amount of or employment to the extent of E prime. And so anything that goes beyond E prime, so anything between E prime and uh, E star, that production no longer happens and those economic rents are simply lost. Okay? And so what this graph simply shows you is the, the calculation that designers of public policy or policymakers need to consider. So on the one hand, they need to consider, well, how much tax revenue do we have? And on the other hand, they need to consider, well, what revenue, sorry, what deadweight loss, what efficiency loss do we have? Right? Um, and you can immediately see here that there are practical challenges, right? Because um, obviously a government needs tax revenue to even just function, even for the most basic things like issuing a currency and, and running a legal system, and a government needs tax revenues, but they create distortions. And so then the question is, how can we actually minimize those, those distortions? This is what we will talk about in, uh, a, at a later stage in this, in this lecture. Yeah, but, but here, the, the bottom line, or there, there are two takeaways from, from this part of, of the lecture. One is the example of the payroll tax clearly shows that the, the tax incidence does not always fall on the side of the market where the tax is actually imposed. So here you can see that that is shared 50-50. So employers pass on the tax partially to workers through lower wages, but only partially. That's insight one. Insight two from this is that we have a deadweight loss, that we have an efficiency loss here and uh, that is something that, that, that highlights this equity efficiency trade-off.